You are listening to the Truth to Live by podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. To learn more about our church, you can check out our website at windwardbaptist.org. Colossians chapter 1. My voice is a little weak, so we'll try our best. Colossians 1. So we, we went to verse 22, I believe. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So we only have from verse 23 to verse 29. So we only have uh, three more points and seven more verses which should take us about an hour. Of course, I don't think my voice is going to last. <laughs> so we see instruct. Paul was wanting to instruct the church, but he's really wanting us as a church to instruct those that are lost. So he says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard. That's a blessing. They heard the gospel. We, all, we've, we have all heard the gospel, and so we've got to continue to get the gospel out. And which, which was preached to every creature which, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, it's interesting that he says that. The gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So the the gospel message is preached to every creature under heaven. And we talked about that this morning, on how God has given the information to us in the creation. Because it says the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. The Bible also says that the light, the light that God has given every man, the light that lighteth every man on the earth, we're all given light. We're all given information. We are all given the creation. So you have to respond to that light you're given. And then the gospel will be given to you. I think some of the people that never actually perhaps never heard the actual gospel message, are people that don't want to hear it. And then you can ha- have people that really hear it and still never heard it. I mean, it was preached to them, but they never really paid attention to it. So we see that Paul is, is, is saying, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, which is what we should all desire to continue in the faith, we should all desire to be grounded and settled, in other words, when you're settled, that means you don't have any desire to move anywhere else. We've got to get to that point where we understand that we're in the place where the truth is. We're in a place where there's nothing outside of the truth that we believe. There's nothing else. There's no plan B. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Paul suffered. There's different kind of sufferings, but he's in jail. He's, he's been, he, he experienced persecution. He talked about the difficulties in, in the care of the churches. But he, he's enjoying that because if you're suffering for something that's worthwhile, then you joy in the suffering. It's just like a, a mother who has a child, she doesn't enjoy the, the birth pains or the pain as involved with child, uh, or birthing a child. But after that the child is born, she rejoices in, in, in it because the, of the child. And that's what Paul is, seems like he's speaking along those lines of that kind of a suffering, that the things he went through was for the gospel to flourish. And it was all good as far as he was concerned. Not, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. Of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. 
We talked about that. The church is, is the body of Christ. We may not, we may not, may not get to see Jesus' physical body, but we see his spiritual body. And look how vast it is. That's all of us. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. The dispensation, the, that period of time. According to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. The mystery. Now, what is this mystery that he's referring to? There are different mysteries in the Bible. In Ephesians, it talked about the mystery of the church. Let me read this. How that by revelation he made known unto me, and this is Paul, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Now, if the church is a mystery, then that means it was not known in the Old Testament. But there are some people today that would say that the church was already in the Old Testament because of the word church is used, meaning congregation, people that gathered together. But that's not talking about the church as we talk about it today. It was a mystery. It wasn't understood like it was revealed today. So that's what Paul's saying. And he's talking about the church in Ephesians, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is he talking about? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So he's talking about the church, Jew and Gentile in one body. He's saying that was a mystery in the Old Testament. It wasn't made, it wasn't made known. So in the Old Testament, when you're, when you're looking for the church, you're not going to find it like the way we see it today. That's why in the prophecies, you don't see the church. It wasn't included. It was a, it was a mystery. So when the prophecies, if you didn't have the church, you just had the, the, uh, basically the nation of Israel receiving their Messiah and the millennial kingdom because that's what was technically supposed to happen. But Israel rejected the Messiah, so they could, not, they could not enter into the kingdom because they rejected the king. So now the kingdom was given to the church internally. That's the mystery. The mystery of the kingdom is that the the king is rejected. The kingdom is offered to another group of people, the church, that we receive the kingdom internally, spiritually. That's the mystery of the kingdom. It's unseen, but it's felt. It's experienced. The prince of peace is not on the earth, but the prince of peace is within us. <clears throat> but in Ephesians, he's talking about the church. In Colossians, he's talking about something different. I mean, it's kind of similar, but it's, he's not talking about the church. And he's going to explain what it is. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. What is the mystery? Next verse, verse 27. So a mystery, I didn't, I didn't really explain what, it, what a mystery is. It's hidden in the Old Testament. It's revealed in the New Testament. That's what a mystery is according to the Bible. It's not talking about a mystery where you're trying to solve a crime or something. Verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. The mystery is that Jesus Christ 
would live within believers through the Holy Spirit. That's the mystery that he's talking about. Now, when did that begin? Pentecost. And I believe that's when the church started. So you have the mystery of, of, of Ephesians, which is the church, and in Colossians, that Jesus dwells in you through the Holy Spirit, which is the, when, when that happened, that church was born. And so they're kind of one in the same. But he's specifically talking about Jesus Christ being in you. The wonder and glory of the abiding, indwelling Jesus was not clearly revealed in the Old Testament, especially that he would abide in the Gentiles. Therefore, this aspect of the work of Jesus in his people was a mystery that wasn't revealed until the time of Jesus and the apostles. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the Christian's hope of glory. It isn't our own hard work or devotion to God or the power of our own spirituality. Instead, it is the abiding presence of Jesus Christ in you. So we see instruct, indwell, and now inform. Really, basically, warning, warning others. Verse 28, whom we preach... Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul wanted the, the, the whole gospel for the whole world. He wouldn't hold back in either area. It was for every man, and he presented it in all wisdom. Look at, listen to these verses. In Acts 20, 21, this was this how Paul felt. This is when he was in, in Ephesus. And when he was traveling back, he didn't get to stop in Ephesus, but he met with the, the leaders in Ephesus. Down the road, they met him, and he spoke to the leaders. And this is what he told them. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, Jew and Gentile, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Is repentance necessary for salvation? Absolutely. But what do you repent of? Do you repent of lies? Do you still tell lies? Try not to, but we still do, right? Some the other day told me the Cowboys is the best football team. That was a total lie. People say that, man, you got to rep- you got to repent. I said, what do you mean by that? You got to repent of your sins. Really? Do you still sin? Well, I mean, try not to. But do you sin though? Are you sinless? No. So did you not repent, or did you repent? Well, I did, but I still went back to some certain things. Well, what does it mean to repent then? It means to go from unbelief to belief. Amen. Repentance means. When someone repents, they're saying, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, and that's the only way my sin that could be paid. And the sin that blocks me from having a relationship with Jesus Christ is removed by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And I put my faith and trust in what he did. That's repentance. And you didn't believe that before. You could have believed anything else. So what does sanctification do? Sanctification, once you have salvation, is now Jesus is working out those sins. And that begins at salvation and it ends when we get to heaven, (laughs) when we pass away. The process continues our whole life. Where we're always a work in progress, right? So we're not sinless, but we will sin less as you grow, right? We're, we're, he's conforming us into his image. And so those lies, he's working them out. The lust, he's working it out. The pride, he's working it out. And then when we do it, and we see the, feel the consequences of it, and he convicts us and corrects us and chastens us, then we say, I don't want to do that again. It's not a blessing. I didn't feel good. I didn't feel right. I didn't feel like me, who I am, or I'm supposed to be. That's sanctification. When you and I get saved, 
he removes the, the, the sin debt, he pays the sin debt, and he removes the, bar- the barrier which prevented us from having a relationship with him. So when you get saved, it, it now means Jesus lives within you through the Holy Spirit of God, and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's what salvation is all about. If someone doesn't want Jesus, they will not have salvation. <laughs> it's not just understanding what Jesus did intellectually. It's receiving him into your life by faith. And he can't come in until the sin has been paid. And I can't pay it by stopping it. Because the ones that I did before are still there. Only Jesus can remove it through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we have to put our faith and trust in the payment of the death, burial, and resurrection for our sin. That's the salvation. So what is that? It's repentance and faith. It's it's the same thing. And when people make light of repentance, then they're removing a major doctrine in the Bible that is, it is necessary for salvation. And there's a lot of people doing that today. You have to repent. What are you turning from? Unbelief. And that's why faith and repentance is the same. Because you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you're turning from Whatever other way you're, that you ever thought you could ever get saved. Religion, good works, anything else. Why don't people want to get saved if it's that easy? Because they don't want to give up their life of sin because they know once you get saved, sanctification is going to do a work. And they really don't want, they think the sin is good. Or they don't even believe Jesus is who he said he, or whatever it is. But it's all unbelief. They either don't believe Jesus is who the Bible says he is, that he is God. They don't believe that. They don't believe that he did what he did. Or they don't believe that salvation is something they really want. Or they don't want a relationship with Jesus. I mean, they're just just being honest. If I have a relationship with Jesus, what's he going to tell me to do? (laughs) They don't want it. They don't want it. What what do people really want a lot of times when they want to get saved? They just want to do what they want to do. And sometimes they think, I'm going to just do whatever I want to do, as if that's going to make their life good. I remember there was a, a lady came to our church. She didn't come anymore. It was years ago. <clears throat> and um, she was a very, she said, she told me her life story. She had a little son. And she said that she, she had become a Christian. She was going to another church. She ended up coming to our church. I think she moved. But she was... Uh, I guess she was, I said, older, uh, older person, but probably younger than how I am old now. <laughs> this was a long time ago. <clears throat> she told me her life story that she didn't want to become a Christian because she just wanted to live her life her way. And she, did, she was very immoral, and then she eventually became a prostitute. And she said, and then one day I just looked at my life and I thought, this is not... Like, I thought if I did things my way, I would have an exciting life, and I had the most, I wanted to even kill myself. And then I got saved, and my life has changed. And the child was a product of, a, of her being a prostitute, but she had a child, and, and um, so she, but, you know, she changed her life, and she said, it's funny how I really thought that I wanted to get saved when I was later on in life, but I wanted to live it up. And I, and I found out that me living it up was not living it up at all. But I've had more peace and more joy since I've become a Christian. I wish I would have become a Christian early on in life. But I never heard anybody say, I've been a Christian for many, many years. I wish all these years I was never a Christian. And I wish I only became a Christian when I, when I was at the end of my life. I've never heard anybody say that. Maybe there's somebody who said that. But I've never heard it. And if you've if you've heard someone say that, then let me know, because then I can say I heard someone say that, but I never have. <clears throat> because a Christian life is the best life you can live. The, the better of a Christian life you live is, the better your life is. The only times a Christian life is, just, is just, uh, uh, not a good life or an enjoyable life is when people try to live it the worldly way. Then it becomes kind of a stressed out life <laughs> because you're trying to, Trying to live it on the, the, on, the, on the fence, yeah. So he said, he's informed everyone. He says, how I kept back nothing that was profitable. It, it was a profitable message. 
But I've showed you, taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is his job of the church leaders. First Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13, he says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Those are your spiritual leaders. And admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. It is the job of the church leaders. It is the job of the church body in general. It is the job of everybody. <laughs> it's not just the job of the church leaders. It is the job of the church leaders. But it's also the job of the, those in the church. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ, Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, the Lord. You know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that's the byproduct. You know, I think we just got to get back to the basics. We just got to fill our life with the Holy Spirit. And then when we do that, we'll do what we're supposed to do, right? teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Romans fifteen fourteen. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Why? Because the goal to present every man perfect or complete or mature in Christ Jesus. Hey, we have a goal. The goal is for all of us to admonish one another so all of us will be perfect and complete and matured in Him. It doesn't say that that's just a pastor's job. That's all of our jobs. So, when you're talking, when you're Fellowshipping. Fellowshipping is not just to shoot the breeze. Fellowshipping is to bond. So that now you, you, you find out each other's life, what's going on. It is all of our business, what our lives are all about. Because then now then you can be able to admonish someone. Oh, I don't think you should do that. Hey, the other day, yeah, I went to a party and had all my had a lot of my friends from high school that were there and they was all drinking and then I ended up starting to drink and, and I ended up getting drunk and you shouldn't be hanging out with them. Oh, why you gotta tell me that? Because I'm your friend. I'm here to admonish you. That's not a good thing. I don't like be your friend no more then. You don't only want to have friends that just tell you what you want to hear. You want to have friends that tell you some, sometimes what you need to hear. Now, to be a friend, you have there's there's you don't just go around telling everybody things, right? You gotta have a you gotta bond with them first. You gotta you gotta be friends. But the purpose of being their friend is to help them to what? To be perfect in Christ. <laughs> That's the goal of it. That's why fellowship is important. In the early church, what did they do? I mean, did they do Christian hula? Did they have rock concerts? I mean, there's things that people do in church, but it's whatever, but you don't have to do that. But you have to fellowship. You have to have the Lord's Supper. You have to have the teaching of the Word of God. We have to be praising the Lord, right? We have to, we have to be um, having a, a time where we are worshiping, right? Just, fi- just find what they did in the book of Acts. Somebody the other day was telling me, Yeah, they ate together. The breaking of bread. That's not talking about eating together. (laughs) Now, they did eat together. But in the Bible, that's not what breaking of bread is talking about. That's talking about the Lord's Supper. That's talking about the Lord's Supper. That's what they did. And they did it every day. Now, Jesus didn't tell us we had to do it every day. He said, but whenever you do it, do it this way. And in the early church, they had a meal together. And Paul told them in the church at Corinth, don't even do that because you guys ain't doing it right. But he never told him to stop having the Lord's Supper. He just told him, don't just have a, a, a fellowship meal together. You don't have to do that, but you have to have Lord's Supper. All of that is for what purpose? Do we have the Lord's Supper just so we can sip a little bit of grape juice and eat a little cracker? There's a whole lot more than that, right? That's, you have to do that. 
What is all this for? What are we fellowship for? Is it a time to gossip? Is it time to make each other laugh? No, I like laughing. I like telling jokes. Let me tell you a joke. There was three guys. One now. <laughs> I'm not a good joke teller. But all of that is for this purpose, to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So that's what, that's what we're, we pray together. I yeah, we've got to be praying, fellowshipping, preaching, worshiping, all that we've got to be doing. For what purpose? So that everyone would be presented perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, if I'm in the process of improving myself or, or me improving because of these, these means, then my life is positive. It's a good life. And if I'm in the process of helping others, do you know, I find this sometimes. I don't think I need to have or need to see. I mean, I'm not saying need, but sometimes when you're involved with something, you're hoping that what you're doing is affecting, you know, or there's positive outcomes. And I find this. I don't think I really need to see that many in Ram turning, turning out good for the Lord. I think I just need to see at least one. That's what I have to focus on. Otherwise, you start driving yourself insane. But me hearing Zeus sing that song today, that was a blessing to me. Because that's the process, to present every man perfect, to see someone, you know, with his son, you know, knowing the past and situations, that, that, that helps a lot. I say, I don't think we need 100%. Maybe we just need 1%. <laughs> I, get on, I get on the guys because they don't come to afternoon service, and I get frustrated. I say, hey, we're going to see, see one guy here. <laughs> I said, you know what? Let's just focus on the, the 1% if we got it, right? <clears throat> and then I think, what, how does the Lord feel with all his people, you know? Of all these, the Christians in the process, how much percentage is actually trying to, to be involved with themselves changing into the image of Christ and helping others to improve themselves so that they could be presented perfect in Christ? I wonder how many percentage when Jesus looks down on all those that he saved, how many is actually doing something? And we might think, It's probably a way lower percentage than what sometimes we see around us. And yet, I think Jesus would still die for those that don't get involved with the process of reconciliation. So, Paul is just saying, you know what? It's our job to warn people. What they do with it, we can't control. But we still got to keep warning them. Whether you're giving them a track, whether you're telling them to subscribe to the podcast or listen to the radio program, or whether you sit down and disciple them verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Hey, you may disciple 10 and one stick. Hey, be thankful for the one. (laughs) Because you know what? That one is worth it. And you know the nine? They may get it later. (laughs) You may not hear, hear about it. It always amazes me when someone who left Ram or the church, and you see them 10 years later, and they're, they're serving the Lord in the church that you didn't even know they were, were serving, and they're like on fire for God. And they tell you, you know what, when all this started was when I was in Ram. The seed was planted because the word of God does not return void. We may not see a lot of the things, but still, involve yourself in the process. And God will take care of the rest. Just like the mailman, he's just delivering the mail, right? If he gives you a bill, are you going to be mad at the mailman? He's just doing his job. And so, that's sometimes the way ministry is. Someone's just doing the job, what God told him to do. Take the message and do with it what it, what it says. And that is Colossians chapter 1. So now in chapter 2, he's going to get into some doctrine. A lot of times people don't want to sort through the doctrine, but man, it's so important to know the doctrine. Even in this chapter, the doctrine you come across. 
is very important when we're trying to show someone that Jesus is God. And in chapter 2 is a doctrinal chapter. So we'll look at that next week. Let's pray. You have been listening to our Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. This podcast is supported by the gifts and donations of its listeners. You can make a secure donation through our website at windwardbaptist.org.